Good evening, everybody. I'd like to invite you back. No, good to have you here for the second day of our Pasture Finished Beef webinar. Uh, I'm Ed Rayburn. Uh, I'm from West Virginia University. I'm an extension specialist working with uh, pasture and forage management and animal nutrition. Uh, I'll be the first speaker tonight and uh, let me, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, animal selection and uh, feeding management. Uh, everything I say tonight, I want you to take in context with your goals. Now, what are you all doing? Uh, each person is going to have a little bit different system, but some basics uh, that everybody wants is product satisfaction, a reasonable price, and return customers. So all a matter of perspective. Uh, that's the beginning of a good meal from a consumer's perspective. Uh, if you're a beef producer, uh, before that steak got on the plate, uh, this is the beginning of the good meal. And to the cow, uh, the steer, heifer, whatever you're growing, uh, this is their perspective of a good meal. So it's the same with uh, what you're doing in pasture finished beef. What are your components? Your market, your animal, climate, weather, pasture, uh, forage supply, and then how do we supplement supply and demand? Uh, again, what is your market? Uh, this is uh, this is the goal you're shooting for. Is it high uh, fat product or a low fat product? Uh, is it grass fed? No, meaning uh, USDA grass fed, or are you mainly uh, a locally uh, local producer? and you might use grain on grass. Uh, I know there's some folks that do that. Uh, are you certified organic or certified animal welfare, welfare or sustainability? <clears throat> All of these uh, come with requirements, costs, and return. Uh, for tonight, you need to be thinking about their requirements. Some of the things that I mentioned aren't gonna be options for an or organic grower or a pure uh, grass fed producer. Uh, anyway, so the animal, breed, frame size, muscle, body condition, maturity, gender, these all have an impact. Uh, I will be uh, presenting some research work that we've done over the years. Uh, this multi-institutional pasture-based beef system for Appalachia, uh, ARS, WVU, Virginia Tech, and University of Georgia. Uh, were the uh, people uh, conducting that. <clears throat> you know, one job we had was surveying pasture beef producers in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, we surveyed uh, just shy of 150 in 46 states and Canada. Uh, the majority of them used Angus, uh, some used Hereford, uh, but a, a third of them used other breeds. Uh, most did spring calving, uh, rotational grazing, and using legumes as nitrogen source in their pasture and hay fields. Now let's talk about body conformation. <clears throat> uh, we want an animal that's deep bodied, has good gut capacity, well muscled, moderate frame, and adequate length, but we'd like a nice straight back. Uh, here's a cow that I think is, uh, to me, a, a good example. Here, uh, you notice how deep her body is here compared to how much sunlight there is underneath her body. Uh, at, at a minimum, this should be 50% of her height. Now, this animal is getting close to two-thirds of her height is body depth. And uh, that's the type of animal I like. <clears throat> uh, here's a performance-tested Angus bull. Uh, again, you can see the body depth on this animal. Uh, he's a frame you know, score five bull, but uh, being performance tested, we know what the EPDs on this animal are uh, and the quality of his genetics for producing uh, good calves, uh, be they steers or heifers. Here's a heifer from that mating. You can see how she's you know, maintaining that good body depth. Did I say heifer? That was a steer. <laughs> Here's the heifer uh, from that mating. Uh, and if not that exact mating, uh, a very similar one. Uh, when we talk 
frame size it's just hip height at a point in time uh, and here is a, a frame score for heifer at 12 months of age she's going to have a hip height at, at right at uh, 45 inches whereas a frame score five heifer at two years of age is going to be up here at pushing you no know, five or rather 51 inches in height uh, and that's uh, that's the way we measure and quantify uh, frame score. Uh, muscle. Uh, you want to have good muscling on the top line and good muscling in the hindquarters. Uh, the nice thing about performance tested bulls, uh, we know what their APDs are and we also, if, if it's the right sale, you'll have ultrasound data on those bulls, which is nice. <clears throat> Now here's a nice 30-month-old uh, heifer, uh, just about ready to uh, go to the uh, butcher. Uh, and this actually is steaks from that heifer. Uh, so you can see the beef steak, uh, nice and round, uh, ribeye there, uh, a fair amount, a touch of marbling in there. Some people like jerseys. Uh, here's some Jersey steer calves. Uh, and this is what they produced at 30 months of age. Uh, the unique thing about them, they don't have a circular uh, ribeye. It's more of a rectangle. Uh, now, jerseys taste really good. The only problem with them is cutout value or uh, pounds of cutout. Uh, for one Angus heifer, I need one and a third Jersey steers. The other way to say it, one Jersey steer is equal to three quarters of an Angus heifer. So um, that has a big impact on yield and uh, product that you have to sell. So uh, in selecting animals, uh, I uh, okay, I've had a cow calf herd, and so I raised uh, heifers and steers. And uh, yes, I'm hung up on EPDs because they are very, they give us a lot of predicted value. If you have that option, I think you ought to use it. Uh, no marbling, I, I look for a plus on marbling on the no sire EPD. Ribeye area, I want it at least average or a little bit plus, but not extreme. Uh, we're not uh, looking for extreme on any of these characteristics really. Uh, yearling weight, uh, I would say negative because yearling weight is uh, correlated with frame size and if you push a positive yearling weight uh, without looking at frame size, you'll actually get into larger uh, frame sizes than what you might want. So that's why I say a negative if you're looking at EPDs. Now, what's on paper is very important, but we also want visual confirmation of the conformation, if you will. Uh, are they going to work on pasture? Do they have the body depth? Do they have the gut capacity? Do they have the visual muscle uh, that you're looking for? Uh, so this is you no, know, this is the phenotype. Up here is the genotype, but we want to see those animals carrying the phenotype also. Uh, two things that aren't uh, readily available in uh, on the genetic size is how do the legs set? You no, know, and how, how are the hooves? Are these animals gonna do well out on pasture? Uh, are they gonna be able to walk around and from the bull side breed a, a cow, but uh, from the uh, side of the sons and daughters of this bull, you no, know, they have to work for us too out in the pasture. So a key element here is the eye of the master finishes the cattle. Uh, you want to use genetics, you want to use phenotype, but then you've got to do the management of both the plants and the animals to get them to achieve that potential. Body condition score. There's a handout on this. <clears throat> uh, I would encourage you to take that handout, go down to your cows and uh, work with your cows and let them teach you body condition scoring. What we're trying, you no, know, it's a scale of one to nine in beef cattle. <clears throat> And it's a measure of how fat they are. Uh, now let's look at it from the standpoint of a finishing animal. 
So here's a small range of the body condition scores, just five through eight. Uh, the fat percentage uh, you know, in the body uh, at, at those uh, condition scores. And this is using uh, NRC uh, body condition scores as described in the 2000 update. Uh, you do have to be careful because there are some different body condition scoring systems out there and they're different by one whole body condition score. So uh, we're talking an NRC description uh, that is in your handout. Uh, so if I want a choice animal, I need to be somewhere around this 28% body fat. And so you're, if you come over here and look at body condition score, it's somewhere between a seven and an eight body condition score to get a choice animal. Select is still above a seven, you know, just a hair above a seven. Now, I really don't encourage getting down into this region. Uh, these animals will make good hamburger. Uh, and if they're cooked right, they'll taste okay. Uh, but I'm not in the market for that animal. There are other people in the market for that animal, okay? <laughs> so every market's different. <clears throat> now, uh, average daily gain is going to determine the body condition score on a young growing steer. And uh, th this is the data that uh, Dr. Dan Fox uh, was able to uh, uh, measure that to get a body condition score eight, okay, here's the final uh, body weight. This, this is, uh, okay, a frame score five steer is gonna be about 1250. So this is on the low end of a frame score five. And this is probably a frame score four, maybe the upper end. Um, now these are finished body weights and uh, within a frame score based on muscling, you can have a fair amount of difference in uh, finished body weight just because of the, the amount of muscle that the animals carry. But uh, if I want a frame score eight uh, in these young growing steers, and that's a, a key point here, we, we're needing to be around a two pound average daily gain. You know, if, if uh, if I'm shooting for a frame score seven, uh, still somewhere between almost uh, two pounds and uh, a pound and three quarters. Now, a good pasture can do that. Uh, this is NRC uh, no, for different average daily gains at different body weights. Uh, how much TDN are they getting? Uh, how well are they eating that? And what is their crude protein? So uh, just using the two pound average daily gain as a benchmark, and I'm not saying that's what you want, but we're gonna use it as a benchmark for right now. Uh, two pounds, uh, according to NRC, you can do it on 60% TDN at 2.8% dry matter intake. Now, these red numbers, uh, 68 and 31, that's what we would expect on good average pasture that's well managed. And here's uh, a difference, big difference. Notice out here we're 21% crude protein and not 10%. And that is not good because that excess protein causes what is known as urea energy cost. Uh, this is the cost of removing excess crude protein from the body. It reduces average daily gain by a, roughly a quarter of a pound a day from predicted averages. Uh, it's the energy requirement equivalent to about a half a percent of body weight of ground shell corn. <clears throat> so if a person was feed, feeding grain on grass uh, on these high quality, you know, high protein pastures, uh, you no, know, a half a percent of body weight ground shell corn, that'd be 4.4 pounds of air dry uh, ground shell corn for an 800 pound steer is about what is needed to feed the bacteria. And that's what we're doing. We're feeding the bacteria in the rumen to give them more carbohydrates so they can use that excess protein 
and then that bacteria protein goes on down into the gut and feeds the cow. Now, if you're strictly grain on uh, strictly grass fed, <clears throat> uh, which I have been for a number of years, uh, this corn is not an option. Or, uh, but there are things that we can do. Uh, high quality grass and forbs. Uh, they're high in TDN and relatively low in crude protein. Uh, spring and fall, that's when we're going to have the highest TDN uh, in all of these feeds, uh, and also the highest uh, fiber digestion uh, in the spring and fall. And that fiber digestion is going to come back to help us you know, bind up uh, you know, some of that, uh, that crude protein. <clears throat> Now, in the summer, if you're willing to grow uh, no, uh, annuals, uh, brown midrib sedan grass or millet uh, do a great job, uh, partly because they are lower in crude protein for their digestibility, and you're not going to have as much excess crude protein. And uh, in, I'm, I'm not going to show a slide on it, but in some of our work, when we had cattle on the brown midribs, they were getting uh, well over two pounds a day uh, during the heat of the summer. Uh, and that can be attributed to the high quality of these brown midrib uh, materials that are adequate, but not real excess in crude protein. So uh, just remember, uh, you know, we have to work around that. Now, let's talk about winter performance impact on uh, total gain. Uh, Jim Neal uh, with ARS uh, put this to, uh, did this study as part of our overall project, and he had three rates of gain: low, medium, and high. And let's just jump. No, the, the difference was in TDN: 61% uh, TDN up to 72% TDN in those rations, uh, and we got a good difference in winter gain. Uh, at the low rate of gain, uh, 0.64 pounds. At the high rate of gain, uh, no, one and three quarter pounds. And I hope you don't mind me talking in round numbers when I do that. <clears throat> uh, so here's the winter gain, uh, 0.64, 1.74. Now let's look at summer gain. Summer gain, 2.13. 1.65. So the animal that did not gain as well in the winter had compensatory gain in the summer. Uh, the animal that was high gaining in the summer had lower gain on pasture. Uh, do note, uh, uh, I, I think in terms of weight per day of age, uh, and that's because I'm starting with a calf from a cow, uh, some people will start uh, you know, from a wean steer weight, and both are valid ways of looking at it. And, just want you to keep in mind this is the way, this is the perspective for this talk, is weight per day of age, okay? And uh, you can see that weight per day of age, they're still a little bit lower uh, than uh, the ones that were on the high winter uh, program. Now, I'm uh, going to be right up front with you. <clears throat> These animals were not killed when they should have been killed. They were killed before their time. And... This was a research project. We had a control group of sibling steers in a feedlot that these pasture steers were being compared to. And the protocol for everything to be harvested at 18 months of age, uh, and that's what a lot of people talk about is 18 months of age off pasture. Uh, and uh, so these animals were harvested at 18 months of age, even though they were not ready. You can see that the carcass weights are too low. Uh, minimum, I would like it over 600 pounds, and preferably, I'd like a 700-pound carcass. Uh, if you okay, when I do the economics on it on my farm, if it's under a 600-pound carcass, I'm losing money. You'll have to do the economics for your own farm and find out what is the minimum carcass size that you can make money at. The other big thing to me is uh, a 2, 2.0 would be low select, uh, 4.0 is low choice. And you can see that we barely made uh, select here. Now, uh, now, the animals that were on the high gain, they were 
between low select and high select. So we didn't do what a farmer would have done, but we can still learn from this. Uh, actually, uh, the data tells us what's happening. Here's a feedlot animal. So keep in mind, identical genetics. Uh, these animals were on a corn silage uh, ration primarily, uh, whereas uh, and they had the same wittering program, uh, low, medium, and high. Uh, so that would be the low winter gain, the high winter gain, the low winter gain, and the high winter gain in the pasture-fed animals. <clears throat> the important thing here is look at this number. Uh, 0 0.011 times final body weight is the uh, that's the slope of these lines, and they're identical. Uh, the intercept's a little different, no big deal. Uh, but it's telling us that if we left these cattle on pasture until we got them up here to, uh, no, um, okay, we want 4.0 for low choice. So we you know, extend this line right up here. So they're going to be a little bit heavier in weight. And that's all that number is telling us. Uh, these pasture animals at the same degree of finish are going to be a little bit heavier than the feedlot animals. And right here it is. Feedlot steers, quality degrade of four, that's low choice, at 1171 pounds on average. Pasture steers, if we had left them on pasture for 80 to 90 days more, and that's what it would have taken given uh, the rate of gain. Uh, so that would have taken them in taking these animals into uh, October and November, which in terms of pasture quality at our location, that's not a problem. That's some of our best pasture. We just have to make sure we've managed it, that we have enough pasture for these finishing animals. But, uh, okay, if we kept them out there when we should have, they'd have come right at 1,200 pounds uh, no, when they made low choice. <clears throat> now, again, Doing it uh, from the cow side uh, versus the wean calf side. If I'm starting out with a 78 pound calf uh, and looking at weight per day of age, uh, if you're trying to finish at 18 months of age to get this uh, 1,200 pound animal, you do need to be a little over two pounds a day. Uh, if you're willing to take a little more time, here's 24 months. Uh, no, weight per day of age is a pound and a half. Uh, 30 months, like that, the heifer and the Jersey steers I was showing you, uh, I can get away with a lower rate of gain uh, to you know, get those animals out there. So again, this is what you need to push the pencil on. What are your costs and uh, uh, where uh, in this, well, where in this range are you gonna be shooting? Okay, we manage body condition score and gain on cattle in a few ways. You want adequate pasture, enough forage mass, and enough forage allowance. Forage quality, think of the acronym VALUE. It's vegetative, it's available, it has reasonable legume content. We'd like 25 to 30% legume in a well-established pasture. I want 10 to 15% forbs. Uh, that would be dandelions, plantain, uh, chicory. Uh, uh, in my pasture, I like curly dock and broadleaf dock. Uh, they're high tannin forages that the cattle love uh, and probably is beneficial in terms of that excess protein. Uh, the other reason that 10 to 15% is for trace minerals, zinc and copper. Uh, grasses and legumes in our area are low in zinc and copper compared to Forbes. Uh, Forbes at 10 to 15 percent are enough to balance th those trace minerals. So if you're an organic producer, uh, that is a big, that's a big ticket item. Not a little ticket item, that's a big ticket. Uh, uh, utilize, utilize the forage to the right level. We'll talk about that. Do all of this in, ter in balance with the environment. The environment's going to infect the forage. It's going to affect your animal. Okay. Forage supply and demand. Forage supply is plant growth rate. Uh, 
no, seasonal growth rate and distribution. Uh, demand, uh, that's your animal requirement. Uh, number, size of animals by class. You no, know, that tells you their uh, nutritional requirement. Uh, you no, know, the classes dry matter intake and TDN required, and also crude protein. Uh, grazing management and buffers are where we're going to you know, do our best to make supply equal demand. And uh, here's the classic curve. Uh, John showed that yesterday, a cool season grass. Uh, you may have a summer slump there. Uh, here's our warm season grass. Uh, that would be my brown midrib sedan grass uh, where I am. Uh, Here's the animal requirement for a cow-calf herd. Uh, as those calves get bigger than when those calves are weaned, and I move those calves either to a different enterprise or off the farm, then the cow requirement drops down here. And here's the you know, finishing demand. So uh, these calves might have come into the finishing program at this point. And so as they continue to grow, uh, that's going to uh, uh, increase the demand on the animals, uh, the finishing side. We need a buffer. When demand is above supply, we need something to buffer the system. Now, here during the summer, we're using the warm season grass. So that is a buffer. But there are other buffers. Well, and first of all, let's look at the climate effect. <laughs> uh, not every place has a summer slump. Uh, <clears throat> if you get into high elevation, uh, at, Allegheny Plateau, uh, we don't have a summer slump. Uh, that's the average right there. Uh, this range shows you uh, two out of three years. No, one in three years is in here. One in three years is up there. Uh, and there's the average. Uh, I only have, to, okay, Terra Alta, that's 3,000 feet. An hour's drive, uh, over to Moorefield, I go down to around six or 800 feet, and I'm on the east side of the Allegheny Plateau. Now you can see a lot of times I'll have that summer slump over there. Uh, I have a lot more risk, okay? Uh, you no know, risk is the space in between that upper and that lower bar, uh, especially look out here in September. Uh, I was talking about having good quality pasture in September and October. I don't have a lot of risk. If I'm over here, I have a lot of risk because of that spread. So you have to know where, where you are and how does climate impact where you are. Okay, buffers. Time of the livestock production to the forage growth cycle. Uh, that may be spring calving versus fall calving. Some areas uh, deeper south, I would encourage fall calving. Uh, where we are spring calving does a fine job. We're 40 degrees north latitude. Uh, make hay and graze the aftermath. Uh, that is one of my top recommends. Uh, making hay is expensive. Aftermath growth uh, helps us you know, fill in that gap during the summer and fall. Strate strategic nitrogen fertilization. Vary the stocking rate. Sell or move animals. Uh, now. Obviously, if you're past your finishing, you're not selling them to a feedlot unless uh, one study we did was the question of buying in stockers, but we're actually going to buy in more stockers than we're going to try to finish in the fall. And so what we do is we buy roughly twice as many stockers as we need, but we look at how they perform and then we keep those that we think are going to finish the best on grass and we take the other half and sell them to somebody that may put them in a feedlot. Now you're going to say, well, that doesn't sound smart. Well, it works wonderful here in West Virginia because the best price for yearling steers is late July and early August at what we call our board sales. Now to get the top price, you do have to have a tractor trailer load, okay? <laughs> A lot of people don't realize that on the commodity market, the tractor trailer load is the unit of sale. Uh, so if you have a uh, just a gooseneck, you're not going to get the top of the market, but you're going to get a good price for those animals. Uh, and you're using them as a bush hog uh, versus uh, a finishing animal. 
I'll add legumes and deep rooted forbs. We talk about warm season. Uh, you can also use cool season annuals. Uh, feed supplemental forage. This could be hay, uh, baleage, uh, or other feeds depending on your marketing program. Uh, waste forage uh, in the spring. I would not encourage overgrazing. Uh, or we accept animal uh, change in animal rate of gain or body condition. And I, we're managers, we need to control these things. So uh, to me, these last two are the least uh, preferred. Okay, one of my favorite programs is uh, grazing aftermath hay fields. Uh, when I've done the economics on that, you, it's hard to justify making second cut hay unless you can get very high quality second cut hay that can be used as a protein supplement on the farm. Now, th there is grounds for doing that. Uh, stockpiling tall fescue. Uh, he, here we have some animals uh, grazing fescue, uh, no, what, almost January, 27th of December. And they've got a lot of grass still in front of them. They're going to be well uh, fed into January, as long as we don't get too much snow. Measure and budget supply and demand. Uh, inventory your livestock numbers and size. Inventory your pasture forage mass and growth rate. Inventory stored hay and stockpile reserves. These are things that we normally take as uh, common sense what you're going to do. Uh, but I have seen a number of folks not do that, especially in bad years. They got tied up with the problems and didn't do their work. And so they didn't do these things. And then all of a sudden in December, they realized they had to buy hay and there wasn't any hay on the market. So you want to be doing this, you know, starting this in the summer and then uh, do a final check at our location, we'd need that to be done the 1st of November, uh, uh, but you'll have a good handle on it by the 1st of October. Uh, and so make your budgets. Uh, if you have to buy hay, buy hay. If you have excess hay, you can sell it. Uh, so I would encourage you also to forage test. Uh, you know, t you know, get your TDN, your NDF crude protein, and we'll talk about the ratio there. Uh, and your goal is to forage sample what the animals are going to eat. That's the key. Uh, okay, there are different ways of measuring pasture forage mass with a ruler or the plate meter. But here's the principle. And don't think of this as theory. This isn't theory. It's just uh, one way of uh, describing what the animals do. Uh, okay. Forage mass, that's what we're looking at here. Uh, we want you to be able to measure forage mass. When we're up in this high range of forage mass, no, forage mass does not limit dry matter intake. The relative intake of that animal is pretty much at its peak as long as I'm up in here. Now, when I start breaking over this shoulder, now dry matter intake goes down. The animal can't get enough forage in a mouthful and can't take enough mouthfuls in a day to keep up maximum intake. Now this green line, this is showing selective grazing. Selective grazing is the ability of an animal to eat, to go out there and pick forage that's higher in quality than the average pasture in front of them. <clears throat> so the first few mouthfuls are going to be you know, higher in protein higher in TDN than average, lower in neutral detergent fiber than average. And I haven't talked about uh, non-structural carbohydrates. This is sugars and starches. Uh, so it's about 20% higher in non-structural carbohydrate. Uh, but then as you require them to graze that pasture off, then selective grazing goes down because they've already eaten the best and uh, They've left the rest, and then ultimately they have to eat the rest <laughs> if you leave them in there too long. Uh, so that's why I really like rotational grazing. It's the one place that I can manage grass and cows at the same time. 
Uh, I I really don't see how I can manage uh, under continuous grazing. Uh, at least not to the degree that I would like to. Just reminder, uh, finishing cattle need to be up here. Uh, dry cows and uh, low milk production uh, mama cows can actually perform down in this area. Uh, and so these are the animals that we can use when appropriate to clean up pasture, stimulate legume growth, uh, but again, doing it in tune with the environment. Okay, under rotational grazing, how much grass do I want to leave there? What's the residual sward height uh, that I want to leave to maintain maximum production? Uh, for finishing beef animal, uh, 3.5 to 4 uh, inches of height. Now, our New Zealand friends know they are the ones pushing this 3.5. And you have to keep in mind that they're finishing animals at a uh, skinnier than what we do. And so I would want my finishing beef animal to be at least at this 4.0. But if I have a cow-calf herd, I don't mind treating them like a wean calf. Wean calves need 4.5 to 5. And if I have a cow-calf herd that can follow my finishing beef, I have no problem uh, running them up here and then letting the cow calf herd, especially if they're dry cows, because look at, uh, again, think about if I'm trying to finish in November and December, I could have the finishing beef, oops, the finishing beef up here at four and a half to five, and then the dry beef cows coming in back to clean things up. And yeah, that two inch height in October, and November, uh, for just a short period of time, emphasize that, uh, is going to stimulate legumes in the stand, but I don't leave them, don't let them, I want to let that pasture recover uh, to make more tillers. Uh, the grass also needs to be cut fairly short in the fall if you want tiller development in the grasses. So uh, time and place is the whole thing. Another way of looking at it, daily forage allowance. Two times the potential dry matter intake uh, will allow the animals to eat at maximum intake. And actually, this is what, this is the rule of thumb the cows like. Now, but here's how we apply it. Let's say here we have a finishing animal. Uh, we want them to eat at 3% body weight. So that's 30 pounds per thousand pounds of animal out there in the herd. Uh, but I'm multiplying that by two, right? So my forage allowance, the daily forage allowance per 1,000 pounds of body weight is 60 pounds of dry matter out there in the, for, uh, the field. And it's the same as 50% utilization, okay? And you've heard that before. Uh, you heard that last night. Let, uh, let the cows uh, eat half and leave half. And lo and behold, this is what the cows are telling us. Each dot is a different pasture, okay? Cows have been each, in each of these pastures between 12 hours and six days. And it really didn't matter. There was no statistical difference. I was hoping to find a statistical difference, but there wasn't one. <clears throat> uh, so uh, you can see on average, they were eating 56% of that initial forage mass. That's how much they ate, the utilized forage mass. And there was uh, another little uh, intercept thing there and what does that mean? Well, again, we're going to follow this line down here to where it intersects with the x-axis. And that's roughly 700 pounds, which is roughly two inches. What is that? Why is that? Well, you heard that last night. Here's orchard grass. I'd like that uh, stick to be up here a little bit higher, because right here is the ground level at uh, almost a half inch on the stick. But no, here's the leaf of orchard grass. Here's the pseudo stem, uh, the stubble, uh, below the, the leaf collar. This is where the carbohydrate reserves are in orchard grass. Now, if I graze it off at four inches, I've left a good amount of leaf area. Even at three inches, uh, we're gonna scoot that ruler up right here's three inches, and I've left a fair amount of leaf area. <clears throat> 
Uh, you don't want to get down into that two inches, and that's what the grass is telling the, the cows. Don't get in here. This is tough, uh, and the cows don't want it. Uh, and that's one way grass has of protecting itself, uh, is making a tough stubble. And this is what I'm shooting for. Nice orchard grass. I'd, uh, I like endophyte free fescue at high elevation, the endophyte enhanced fescue at lower elevation. But again, I want my forbs. Uh, this one has mainly, mainly dandelion in it. Uh, plantain is uh, another really good one uh, that I have on my operation. Uh, so we're gonna manage to meet demand. Animal requirements. We're going to manage forage quality and supply, and as needed, uh, we'll supplement. But when do we need to supplement? <clears throat> Talk about forage sampling. If you're doing pastures, uh, I recommend uh, and get farmers to do that once a month for at least uh, three years. Uh, you know, whatever pasture they're going in this week, let's say we're going to sample the second week of the month. Uh, the first pasture they go into that uh, week of the month, I'm gonna follow the cows around and let them teach me how to sample what they're gonna eat in that pasture. And then you do that, uh, you're gonna get different pastures, different months, uh, you're gonna learn from it, okay? You let the cows teach you. Uh, hay and baleage, each year, each lot of hay. A lot of hay is uh, the hay out of a field that was cut on the same day. Uh, forage testing, when we push the numbers on it, uh, if you're using your forage test properly, you can save $10 for every dollar you invest in forage testing. <clears throat> and uh, just to show you the range, uh, here's around 1,000 hay samples. And again, it's uh, West Virginia and the Northeast, uh, roughly half in West Virginia, the other half of uh, pasture uh, was across the Northeast. Uh, but you can see a protein uh, average is 50 percentile. Uh, you've heard the old saying, all the children were above average. Uh, sorry, doesn't work in hay and pasture sampling. <laughs> uh, wish it did. But uh, notice crude protein in hay, 11 percent, pasture, 21. TDN, 54 uh, in hay, 68 in uh, pasture. Uh, NDF, 67 in hay. Uh, 50 in, in, the, uh, in the pasture, NDF. Uh, of course, we have a lot of lower quality hay. We also have higher quality hay in pasture. Uh, you'll have those numbers. You can take a look at them. Season impacts it. Our highest quality energy is in May and October. I don't have numbers here for November. Sorry about that. Uh, our lowest is in June because that's when the seed heads are coming up and we're not perfect in managing seed heads. Now, uh, forage NDF or ration NDF and NDF intake. This is, I feel this is an important chart because you're going to hear a lot of talk about a cow can't eat more than 1.2% of body weight in NDF. Okay. Notice that that's the, the cows did not get the memo. Their email must have been down. Look at all these cows. Now these are dairy cows, uh, and some of these these cows may be on TMRs. These are the beef cattle. Here are beef cows, and here are uh, steers. They happen to be Holstein steers, but they all pretty much follow fall around the same line. And they're getting up here. Uh, the, the, these are mama cows that are in lactation. Uh, Two percent of body weight. NDF intake. Now do note that dry matter intake goes down. So they're eating a lot of fiber, but their dry matter intake is down here, what, 2.7% on average. You know, look, the cows are a little bit higher. Um, the bulk of the steers are right around the average. We've got two lots of steers here that are lower. But uh, so in this 50% NDF range, which is average pasture and above, uh, our dry matter, okay, 50 per, okay. If it's 50% NDF pasture, that's average. So 
a higher quality pasture is going to have less NDF. And so in those higher quality pastures, we're talking about somewhere over 3% body weight dry matter intake. And that's what we're looking at here. Again, notice there is a lot of variability. Uh, there are other things going on out there other than just NDF. Okay. Uh, the other thing in the winter feed that you want to be aware of is this crude protein to TDN ratio. Uh, hays that are uh, high in fiber may be low in TDN, uh, crude protein. And if the crude protein to TDN ratio is uh, down here uh, below 0.2, it's telling us that there's not enough protein in that feed to feed the bacteria. Again, we're getting back to the bacteria. We've got to feed bacteria in the rumen if we want the cow to perform at her best. <clears throat> so, and when I say cow, that could be the yearling steer or steer calf, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so, if I have hay down here, I need to give a protein supplement. Now, I said that sometimes it's worthwhile cutting some second cut uh, hay that's really high in protein. And again, the forage test tells us if I have hay that's up here, that can be my protein supplement to feed with this hay so that the bacteria get all the protein they need and dry matter intake will go up to the, uh, on average to 2.5% of body weight on these uh, hay-type hay diets. <clears throat> Again, uh, some of these hays are getting uh, over 3%, up, up to 3% uh, dry matter intake. And these are probably low in NDF. Uh, as I said, you know, there are multiple things going on out there at one time. The forage test is going to give you a lot of information to try to interpret what's happening on your farm. Supplements. Now, again, if you are all forage, uh, most of these supplements aren't going to work for you. The one that will work are soy hulls. These are considered uh, a fiber source, uh, and so soy hulls would you know, work for you. Um, I don't know if wheat mids would work or not. Again, they're uh, basically fiber. But sometimes if you look at a batch of wheat mids, you'll see the flour that's left in them. So you have to go back and see if, if you're in a certification program, is that authorized? Now, one reason I don't like certification programs is they tell me what to do. And I'm too much of an animal nutritionist that wants to feed my cow and the rumen bugs. So uh, I'm personally not certified and never will be. Uh, and so for those folks that aren't certified, uh, you can use these other feeds, like corn gluten feed, cotton seed hulls. Uh, okay, those are a fiber. Um, uh, whole cotton seed, distiller's grain. Uh, we basically look at crude, if they're crude protein supplement for those low uh, crude protein to TDN haze, uh, we want to be up here somewhere around 24, uh, 30. Uh, their soybean meal, 50%. Uh, if you have uh, high crude protein hay uh, and you're willing to feed uh, energy supplement, then something like barley or shell corn go along with that. <clears throat> now, uh, blasphemy, I know. Uh, keep in mind that the work done at Virginia Tech, Joe Fontenot uh, and his students, uh, I have to give a disclaimer. Uh, Joe was one of my major advisors, Joe Fontenot and Roy Blazer. <laughs> so, um, uh, but we, we butted heads all the time. But anyway, their research showed that 30 days out on full, full pasture feed was enough to get the omega-3 fatty acids up to the level that we want them to be at. So, Basically, I take that research and I say 30 to 60 days. Uh, if I use some of these during the winter uh, and then I put them out on pasture uh, for the summer and into uh, October, uh, 
there, there'll be no impact on the omega-3 fatty acids from any of those feeds if they're allowed in your program. Uh, just real quick showing you uh, dry matter intake. How much dry matter intake on average pasture do we need? You need 2% dry matter intake just to maintain body weight across this whole spectrum of animals. We've got to go, uh, if we want two, per, two pounds average daily gain, we're up uh, around 3% body weight dry matter intake. But if it's that brown midrib, you'll probably get two, two pound gain. If it's high, pro, high protein orchard grass clover, you're probably gonna get about a pound and a quarter, even though you have that uh, 3% dry matter intake. Bear with me, okay. And just remember, this is the tool you're gonna to use. What's the forage height? Uh, how's the quality of the pasture? This tells you uh, a, a lot about what that animal's doing out there. And so keep the, in mind the tool is, uh, you know, how tight are you making them graze that pasture? And you, the finishing animal, you don't want to force below four inches. If you are, can have it higher than that, it doesn't hurt. If you can clean it up with another animal. But if all you have is finishing animals, then uh, don't take it down below four inches. Uh, There's some nice uh, calves out on uh, high value pasture. Remember value, vegetative. Uh, drought management. Let's talk about that real quick. Because remember, half the time you're in, in a drought, right? So you want to have a drought plan before you have a drought. Uh, this allows you to know what to do beforehand. You're not going to make mistakes if you have a plan beforehand. Uh, if you get to that point where you have to implement it, you've got the plan. Uh, and the plan is also going to tell you what to do after the drought. If there's damage, how are you going to manage things? We're not, this is a whole talk in itself. We're not going to get into it. Here's the key right here, the magic. Stock the farm at 85% of the economic carrying capacity to manage for drought 85% of the time. Now, that's an old Texas proverb I learned at least 40 years ago. And I've actually tried to test it. And I have tested it both with, uh, well, first of all, <laughs> with experience. Uh, basically 40 years of experience uh, and then uh, experience of a friend of mine over in Virginia, uh, this is exactly right. Uh, even in Virgin uh, Virginia and West Virginia, 85% uh, of the carrying capacity will cover us 85% of the time. And when we do computer models, uh, they're just computer models, but they give us the same answer which tells me the computer model might be right. <laughs> okay, lower stocking rate, bigger calves, drought risk management. And I have the master, finishes the cattle. On the animal management side, a fat cow is half wintered. Use EPDs, frame score, body conformation, body condition. Do a good herd health. And then animals that don't work, they become hamburger, okay? That's a very important selection tool, your hamburger cows. <clears throat> Forage management, you can't starve a profit out of the cow. Rotational grazing, timing and intensity. Uh, no, we wanna give enough regrowth that, that uh, those plants build up carbohydrate reserves. John talked about that. Three, at least three leaves uh, per tiller. Uh, uh, and that's a good rule of thumb on uh, uh, grasses that don't uh, joint in the aftermath. So if you're talking orchard grass, rye grass, fescue, uh, bluegrass, uh, those are good rule of thumbs. Uh, okay, uh, don't graze it below four inches if it's a finishing animal. Do your budgeting. Uh, John talked about soil testing, lime fertilizer, forage testing, then a good mix of clover, forbs, and quality grasses. 
these are the keys. The eye of the master, that's you. You've got to develop the eye and don't forget these. You want fat cows. A fat cow is half wintered and I see too much out there about you no know, saving uh, saving feed. Uh, now we don't want to be no spendthrifts, but what we don't want to do is starve the cow at all. Uh, I'd rather waste a little feed than have a cow go backwards in body condition score.